Hello, hello, hello. I see there's quite a few people that's joining already. It's great to see. Hi, uh, Sally. How's it going? <clears throat> hey, Des. Great to see you. Uh, hope you all well. Hi, Karina. Hi, Tracy from Abu Dhabi. Very hot in the UK, Sally. I must say, I'm very jealous. We've got a massive cold front coming over South Africa. So, um, apparently, some snow on the mountains and things. So, we're feeling it. Um, well, we started feeling it this afternoon, and it's definitely, I think, by tonight and tomorrow morning, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be real. Hi, Anne from Germany. Rainy Vienna. Doris. Karina, nice to see you guys. Thank you so much for joining, man. And from Switzerland. Hey, people from all over. That's very cool. Very, very cool. I think we've got a pretty much a full crowd today. I think it's up to about 40 people. So that's going to be a nice one. I hope, there's, I hope you guys have got a lot of questions. And I hope again that this can add some value to your photography and help you with a few, a few tricks here and there. Let's just give it a couple of minutes and then uh, we can get cracking. See some nice familiar faces. See Barbara's there. Hi, Barbara. Martha is in. How are you doing, Martha? Hannah, thank you very much for joining. Bianca. Great to see. I really have been loving these uh, these webinars. It really has been fantastic. And, and thank you so much for all of you for all your engagement. It really has been. Um, so great to see, and it's uh, it's a very rewarding for us. And it's almost like a drug for us, you know. You um, try and connect with people, and I think like having this the Zoom platform now, it, it's definitely something that we're going to be doing, even post um, this whole coronavirus thing. I think there's great value there, great connections with you guys as well. Uh, while we wait, um, I think we've got about like a minute or two before we start going. If you guys are, um, if you want to sort of um, hit me up to say what you struggle with um, from a nighttime photography point of view, feel free to hit me up in the, in the chat box. Let me know what it is that you're struggling with um, from sort of photographing wildlife at night point of view. Is there anything in particular that you're battling with? Please let me know. I'm sure I'll cover it in this webinar, but um, yeah. If there's anything that you guys, anything in particular that you struggle with, then let me know. And hopefully by the end of this webinar, we'll have it all sorted for you. Okay, so Martha's saying anticipating the correct exposure. Yes. Sally, just the settings, you get into a panic. Okay. Right, so I think we can, we can get this uh, going. Let me just see how many people are in already. Okay, about 28. So we've got about, let's give it another minute. Um, the correct exposure is, can definitely be a challenge, and it, it's often, uh, it often depends on how close your, your animal is to you. Uh, and also, like, there, there's no real sort of set in stone settings that you can go to, you know, because it also depends on the strength of, the, of your spotlight that you're using and things like that. So I'm going to be covering um, all of that in this webinar, and hopefully by the end of this, then 
and you'll have some more clarity on, on all of those um, all of those topics. Okay, exposure and shutter speed always seems I get it too slow. Tracy, perfect. Um, and I think I think I'm going to be able to help you with this one. I hope so. I'm going to try my best at least. <laughs> All right, well, let's, um, I think let, let's get cracking um, on this. Um, yeah, I think the other people, maybe, maybe some people are still sleeping in a little bit. You never know. But um, this, when I thought of, um, thought about this topic, it's a bit of a, a love-hate relationship for me, to be honest with you, because um, for me personally, I'm not, I'll be totally honest, I'm not the, the biggest fan of night drives, um, purely because I've got this feeling that you know that should be a time when a lot of the wildlife should be should be left alone and, and left to do their thing. You know that they see vehicles throughout the day, and at night they should be left to do their thing. But then you do get the opportunity, um, especially in, in Southern Africa parks, where you can go and um, sort of do night drives. And often then, if you if you do get amazing sighting, then um, the photographic opportunities and the images that you can create you often look back and think, wow, that was actually worth it. Um, I prefer personally to go out with, with a plan when it comes to night drives. So if you had like a, if you have lions feeding or a leopard in a particular area, to then go and photograph that and not just sort of drive around because um, night drives can be, can be quite boring. It's almost like watching a, a tennis match, just looking at the, the spotlight from left to right. But, um, yeah, like I said, it does give you the opportunity to create some some unique and, and very interesting images. And we're gonna we're gonna be chatting through, um, I think through about three or four things that I think is, is vitally important when you're photographing wildlife at night. And I'm gonna start with um, with the first one. Let's make this nice and big. Yeah, I'm sure you guys can all see that. Um, different metering modes now. A lot of people don't understand the different metering modes. I'm going to be touching um, just on two that I, that I sort of think are, are vitally important. Now, if you're using um, uh, Nikon cameras, then your matrix metering and spot metering are, are two crucial, crucial um, metering modes. And then in Canon, the evaluator, which is the same as your matrix, uh, matrix sorry, and then um, spot metering. Now, just a... Um, a quick one in the in the chat box. Any of you guys, do you understand the different metering modes and what they do? Okay, understand. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, so everyone understands different metering modes. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna explain it to you briefly in here. Um, let me sorry. Let me just move my chat box and things, yes, I can see what I'm doing. Okay, so spot metering um, is exactly what it, what it says. So it's a very small, um, it takes the, like your exposure reading in a very, very small area, usually on your, on your focal point um, th that you often in low light, you're gonna use your center focal point because that's the most accurate from a focusing point of view. And it basically just takes an exposure reading from there, right? Whereas with evaluative metering, if you look at it right down at the bottom there, it takes a reading of almost your entire frame. Okay. So that's what spot metering does. So like if you focus on the face of the um, of your subject, it's just going to take the exposure reading on that and it's going to ignore your background, which comes in very handy if you have a, a subject that is very light in color and you've got a very dark background. Okay. Whereas if with evaluative, it takes a background and everything into consideration. So this is more or less almost what goes through your camera's, um, your camera's mind. And please feel free to, to ask questions or um, tell me to woe if, if, if something doesn't make sense. But when you're shooting in evaluative metering or matrix metering, this is basically what your camera is, is, is thinking. So. You see the dark areas at the back behind the egret. So there, your camera shutter has to open a little bit longer because your camera wants, remember your camera doesn't know that there's a bird there. Your camera's taking the entire scene and wants to find like a happy medium for, for everything. So some of the dark areas, 
the shutter speed will have to stay open for a bit longer. The brighter areas, it doesn't have to stay open that long. There by the water, it's a sort of in-between phase. And then with all of that, it will give you like an average shutter speed. Okay, so like if all of this, maybe your average shutter speed is maybe going to be one over, say, 250 or 320, somewhere around there. That's how your camera things when, when it's in evalu um, evaluative or matrix metering. If you go into spot metering in this particular case, you can see on the egret itself, it's very, very white. So it gives you a far shutter speed because it says, okay, you just want an exposure for that bird. I don't need to worry about the background or anything. I'm just going to give you an exposure for this very bright bird and it gives you a far shutter speed. All right, so that, that becomes crucial now also with photographing wildlife at night. Okay, so if you if you on evaluative metering or matrix metering, now imagine the spotlight is on your, I see your question there, thank you very much, I'll get back to that now. Um, if you if you on matrix or evaluative and the spotlight is on your, say, line, for example, and the background is all black, your camera is going to want to try and get detail in those very um, dark areas, those black areas, which means your shutter speed is going to be very, very slow. It's like for those dark areas, it might have to stay open for 15 or 20 seconds. But if you then change your camera onto spot metering, you can then put it on your subject where, where the um, spotlight is shining. It'll be bright. So your shutter speed will be fast. So often like your shutter speed will be up to 400 even 640 and 800. So for me personally, there's, um, there, there's two ways that I like to, to photograph wildlife at night or uh, two sort of um, two modes. You, you can shoot an aperture priority. Um, and I think then this is where like a 2.8 lens comes in really, really handy. Um, like a, a 300 mil 2.8, 400 mil 2.8, those big prime lenses or something like a 70 to 200. That 2.8 makes a massive difference, just sucks up all of that light. Um, so an aperture priority, right down to 2.8, have spot metering on, and generally you'll find, um, and also to try and rest your camera on a, on a bean bag. And often you'll find, because you've got spot metering, more often than not, your shutter speed will be fast enough. Okay, so you'll see as your subject comes closer, the, the light becomes more intense. So it'll give you a faster shutter speed. Um, obviously, when your subject moves away, a little bit more, the light won't be as intense. So then you'll have to sort of get away with the slower shutter speed. But the cool thing is, if your subject is further away, I hope, hope I'm making sense here. Let me, let me know if it doesn't make sense. But if your subject is further away, you have a slower shutter speed, right? Because the light from the spotlight is not as intense, but also the, the movement is not as exaggerated. So you can still get away with shooting, even with the 300 or 400 more lens, you can still get away with shooting like at an 80th of a second, somewhere there and thereabouts, as long as your subject is not running. Okay. Makes sense so far, yeah? So there, there's a sort of quick, quick idea of what the different meterings do. So evaluative or matrix metering on the left takes your background and everything into consideration. Center weighted, I wouldn't worry about that too much, but it basically focuses on the middle and then spot metering there where you put your focal point. Okay. So something like this, for example, and this is what I love about photographing at night. You know, it's, and look, I, I think before we, um, before we get into this, let me get back to this question. Uh, it's one I've been trying to, uh, I was hoping it won't come up, but it's, uh, it's regarding using flashes. Um, personally for me, and like, look, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. You can speak to different photographers. They're all going to give you um, different answers. My personal feeling is I, I'm not a, not a fan of using spotlights um, at night. Uh, not spotlights, sorry, flashes at night. Um, I feel the, the spotlights, and it's, I think this is also, you know, where it has to, you have to be so careful, you know, you, it's on the boundary, on, on the line from, from an ethical point of view. It can be done in an ethical way, but I think using flashes, for me, I, I just find that the differences between dark and then bright, all of a sudden, it's just too much for the animal's eyes to handle. Especially for, for me, that sort of, 
I run photographic safaris. Um, if I've got four clients at the back and they're all popping flashes the whole time, I'm not convinced that it's, uh, it's very good. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. That's um, from what I've sort of experienced over the last 12 or 14 years with doing this kind of stuff. Um, for me, a spotlight is a lot more even light. So your animal's eyes, their, their pupils do adjust. And you, like generally, you don't shine the spotlight straight in the eyes. You normally shine it sort of on the, the, the chest or the legs. And that, that reflective light bounces on, into the eyes. So um, it's a lot more even light. So the eyes can adjust. And then with you taking photos, the light, it's not changing. So for me, that's, um, that, that's my sort of side of it. And so sh long story short, I, I'm not, not a fan of, um, of flash photography. Okay, so but like, like you can see with the spotlight here now, you, you can create some really sort of artistic and, and creative images. You get beautiful reflections in the water if you get an animal drinking. And um, you can see a leopard. Um, sort of moving towards us in the road. The other form, or the, the, sorry, I was bouncing around a little bit. I said like using aperture priority. You can also use manual as well and still use spot metering. So my, it's probably more often than not my preferred option to go and um, to go manual, but you have to be very mindful of that. You know, when your subject moves closer to you to increase your shutter speed. So otherwise, like say, for example, that previous image, if that was at an 80th of a second, if it comes closer to you and you're still on the 80th, you're obviously going to end up with a very overexposed image. So it's just constantly, you have to sort of take a shot and have a look. And then once you do it sort of a couple of times, you understand, I think a lot of the, these images here that were um, close by were up to like 800th of a second because you can really afford to really sort of go fast with your shutter speed Make everything else black and just expose for your for your subject. Uh, Victor, I see your question there. I'm going to come back to that now. Thank you. And again, you know, as it comes closer, you can see there's a bit of movement in the leg, but that you know that's part of it. And I think it's something that you have to understand that you're not going to freeze everything because um, the majority of the scene is quite dark. And I think even with this, um, it wasn't a very strong spotlight in, in this particular case. So the shutter speed was still around that sort of 320, 400 mark. Um, so you will get a bit of movement in the leg, but like I said, if you can rest it on a, on a bean bag, focus on the head and you've got that spot metering, but without the spot metering, you're really, really gonna struggle. And I think that, that's, that's one of the, the, key, the key elements is, is the spot metering. Again, as it comes closer, and you can even just do sort of two clicks um, faster, if, like when it, when it comes closer to you. I think a lot of the times, so this one I think was at, uh, I'm just having a look at my computer here. This is at, at a thousandth of a second. All right, so very far shutter speed because that light is quite intense, but you can see again that the light is sort of on the chest area. You can see that that's where it's bright. And generally the animals, they, they don't seem to mind that too much. I think it's also important, you know, to, um, to also highlight in this particular case that you, you're only using the spotlight on these nocturnal animals, so like your lions and leopard, and, and then you've got some other creatures that sort of don't come out during the day all that often, right? Your porcupines, pangolin, artfuck, these kind of things. Um, and I think you, you've, got to be, you've got to be so sensitive with, with these kinds of things, you know? So if, if like this leopard, for example, if he, if he sees a few impalas, then you have to sort of decide that the photographic side of it has to stop. You, know, you have to switch the lights off. And, because if you now go and shine on the leopard or on the impalas, you're now sort of interfering with the whole hunting thing and um, giving one an advantage above the other. That makes sense. So that's why I say you've got to be so careful and um, and how you do it and, and, and just be super, super sensitive. But you can get, like I said, very creative and I think the, the, the nice thing with, the, with photographing at night, especially if you have two vehicles, is you can manipulate where your light is coming from. What we often did, like we used to do um, a few um, seminars at, at Sabi Sabi in the Sabi Sands. We will then have sort of three or four vehicles out and we will then sort of let the vehicles take turns. So one, our vehicle will like um, switch off all our lights 
and the vehicle from the side, they'll switch their lights on. So you get side lighting. You can also then do a bit of backlit stuff. So it really does allow you to get quite creative with this kind of thing. The one downside is that um, obviously your depth of field becomes a bit of an issue. So as much as you want to shoot like an F8 or F9, you can't just because there's not enough light. So um, like I said, majority of the time, 2.8, maybe like F4. I think that is really, if you want to, if you want to take these kind of images, those would be, I would look for those lenses with a, um, with a wide open aperture of like, if you can get 2.8, that's great. Otherwise F4 um, also just as good. I just want to see Vic, Victor's question here. Can you please give us guidelines on the number of focus points you use for nightlight. Uh, Victor, so I would, I would just use one focal point. I'll just, uh, um, generally when, when, when I'm photographing uh, mammals, to be honest, I generally only have one focal point that I, um, that I keep on the, on the eyes or on the face. If you're doing, I'll show you now when you're doing backlit stuff, then um, like your focal points change a little bit. Um, again, a bit of side lighting. Um, sorry, like Martha just asked you, can you also address suggested color balance? That's a fantastic point. Um, I can actually, what I'll try and do is I'll try and open Lightroom. I'll just show you a quick, a quick photo, but I, I would generally, because with your spotlight, it does give a very orangey feel. So what I often do is, one of the first things I'll do is just bring the temperature down slightly. And, and that's why you see the previous images, a lot of them, um, I actually convert into black and white. I think black and white, for me personally, I, I love the creative feel that it gives. Um, whereas, you know, color it can often be quite orange. Okay. Again, you know, something like this, I absolutely love creating these kind of images. And, you know, if you have like your apex predators, lions on a kill, you know, unless there's really like a whole bunch of hyenas and the lions could be vulnerable, then I wouldn't do it. But otherwise, if they're feeling like this, you can really sort of, I won't say go wild with them. Um, with the spotlights, but you, you can really maximize your time there because they're feeding, they're not bothered, uh, and you can get some, like I said, in, like incredibly creative, almost like studio-like images. And I think, I really think that that's what I would really say that, you know, this nighttime photography or photographing lines at night is really worthwhile. If you know they've got a kill somewhere, that you know they're not going to move, so photographically it just makes it a lot easier you don't have to worry about them moving too much it is um it is great fun this was the old uh I can't remember, like one of the tooth guys i don't know i don't know their names uh, i think it's one of the birmingham is it birmingham mail i don't know but anyway he was a very well known guy in the in the sabi sands i don't know if he's still alive last i heard he was in that kakuza area so in in kruger national park but very unmistakable, that sort of loose tooth. Um, apparently from an encounter with a giraffe, I think it was. Again, proud of lions on a kill. Again, really, really moody, eyes big, blood on the face, Charleston male. Thanks, Barbara. Um, oh, he died last year. That's, um, didn't know that, but yeah. So um, lions with on a kill, um, the blood on eyes open, it just gives that sort of ghosty feel, which um, I think is, is fantastic. And I think it also, it, it, it does for me personally, again, I think it does feel a bit more natural than, you know, having a, having a spotlight on that. I think the spotlights often gives a lot of this sort of fake light around it, which um, I'm personally, I'm not a big fan of. Again, like I said, um, beautiful for uh, reflections. And again, you know, th this, this particular leopard is was in, in South Luangwa. Now, if you see that they sort of on a hunt and quite often they will actually sort of pick up the scent of, of other animals before you even know it. And, and as soon as their sort of body goes down, we would then switch the, the spotlights off. And I think that's something that you've got to be, um, be prepared for, you know, and with a scenario like this, I think it's very difficult to, to plan shots when, when it comes to photographing wildlife at night, because you gotta, you gotta have that fine balance between you know, getting your images, but also um, keeping the well-being of the animal in mind. Okay, so then like I said, then you can do some of the, um, the backlit images. So this is what we, uh, what we did in the Sabi Sands. Um, 
we have one vehicle sort of parking on the other side of your subject. And in this particular case, what I would do, still on spot metering, I would try and focus on that sort of brightest part of the main. So the highlights um, down at the bottom or on top. So put your focal point on that, and that's where your, your camera will then take an exposure reading. So you're not worried about sort of the eyes with things being pinched sharp because that's going to be black anyway. You just want that beautiful um, outline, that rim. So something like that. Now I'd focus on those, those bright areas, even down sort of just below his chin, focusing on that and you'll get um, the rest of your, your subject will be completely underexposed. And I, this is probably one of my favorite types of photography, you know, whether you're doing with a spotlight or during sunrise or sunset. Um, I think it's, it's really a lot of fun. And when you get it right, it, it is very rewarding. Okay. Again, Leopard as well, also in South Luangwa. I think if you, if you have two vehicles, then you can really sort of play around with this quite a bit. Um, and it, it, it is a lot of fun. It, it, does, it does become a little bit addictive almost, but it is a lot easier when, um, if your subjects are stationary. You know, once they're moving and they're sort of cruising around to try and get one vehicle ahead of them and then to, to get the time to, to um, fire away is very difficult. It's also important to remember, you know, when you're doing something like this, your shutter speed, of course, will be slower than if it was from your spotlight and the animals are walking towards you, right? That's why it's, it's so important that you try and get your focal point on those sort of bright areas and just keep your camera dead still and, and, and keep trying, keep firing away. Um, I think a lot of time pe people give up because your camera doesn't want to focus. And I... 100%, th this is without a doubt where your really expensive lenses come into their own. You know, the, the prime lenses, they just focus a lot faster. Um, but yeah, don't give up. Just keep trying, keep, keep focusing. And eventually you'll find, because like, remember you, your camera is looking for that point of contrast. So if you just sort of putting your focal point in this particular case on the eyes, there's no contrast there. It's all black. So it's going to try and focus the whole time. So you just got to try and move it around and just look for that bit of um, point where there's a, a bit of contrast and that's when it will focus and you, then you can fire away. Also something, so this is, uh, I tried this last year actually. Hmm. It's also a lot of fun when you, when you, you can then do double exposures as well um, on, uh, when you're doing night photography. I haven't played around with this um, too much, to, to be honest, but purely because you know, often when I go out in the field, I've got guests with me and I'm focusing on, on, on their images and helping them with, with settings and things. But in this particular case, I was with a friend um, at, their, um, at their reserve and started off just taking a photo of the, of the moon and then found the, found the leopard and then sort of did a double exposure in camera. There's a lot of the cameras now uh, I know with a lot of the Canons, the, the 5Ds, the 1Ds, you can actually, if you take a photo of the Milky Way or the moon, you can actually see the image in the back of your screen. So it makes it easier for you to recompose um, and then take a photo of the leopard. So double exposures, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, you can do it with chameleons and all sorts of things, um, combining two images together. And I think there's, there is a bit more of a skill to this. I promise you, it, it's, it's not simply just sort of clicking and putting it together. It is, is a lot, uh, lot more difficult than what it looks. And then, like I said, I mean, the, the, the nightlife that, that um, comes out, I think that also brings a bit of excitement. You know, you get to see things that you wouldn't see during the day. So this is a, a pals fishing owl, um, very rare to see. And this is actually in, in South Luangwa. And if you want to get images of these guys, look, you'll be extremely lucky if you get one during the day but they're more active sort of at night. Okay, so um, really beautiful birds and, and extremely special to, to see on any safari. And then also, like I said, the, the, the pangolins, pangolins, aardvark, um, you know, porcupines, these animals come out during the night. So 100% agree that if you want to get photographic opportunities of these guys, the night drives are definitely the, the way to do it and way to explore. There are a few places, especially now uh, during the winter months, when these, um, these nocturnal species will become active during the day as well. But for the most part, they're active at night. And, 
and their eyes, you know, their eyes are generally not great at the best of times. So the light doesn't really have that much of an impact on them. You can see very, very small eyes. So um, for them, it's not too much of an issue. Okay, then also seeing things like chameleons, which uh, you more often than not, not see at all during the day, just because their camouflage is so amazing. Um, and actually, if you, if you go on a night drive with the spotlights, they actually, you'll see they'll appear like this lumo green um, and they, they, they really do stand out quite a bit. People often think, you know, how do you see these things? But it, it, is, a, it is a guide's trick. You know, if you, if you know what you're looking for, it looks like a very um, luminous sort of green leaf almost. But yeah, they, they're incredible to see during the, the summer months in South Africa. Okay, and then also even um, animals around camp, you know, always have a, a tripod with you because then, you know, you can really sort of shoot the, like, um, very slow shutter speeds. So this is actually, um, this is actually five seconds that uh, this stayed open. And you can see there is a bit of movement there. Luckily, he wasn't cruising around too much, but you never know what wildlife could, could come into camp. You know, a lot of the camps have uh, genets and civets and things coming through. So um, again, with them, try and get a bit of like a, a torch or something on them and um, have, a, have, have it on spot metering and, and go from there. I think it's a lot of fun. So I wanted to get to, uh, let me just try and see if I can open up Lightroom here. Okay, I just wanted to show you guys how, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, you know what? I don't have my don't have my hard drive plugged into this thing. Uh, let me go back to the other image, but I just want to show that um, you know, Martha did mention that you know with um, with the colors, with the the temperature being um, so warm in a lot of these images. So that that photo in particular as well, even maybe this one. Um, is to, when, when you're photographing with a spotlight, like it does, it does give you that sort of orange color and you have to try and bring the temperature down a little bit. Or like I mentioned, if you, if you turn it into black and white, it does give quite a sort of creative um, feel to your images by turning it into black and white. Do you guys have any questions on that? Um, I think that is, I sort of, uh, hope that that helps a little bit. I just want to see if there's let's see, there were a few questions that popped up. Um, I hope that that helps a little bit more sort of from an understanding point of view and how to, how to get these images. Otherwise, if it doesn't make sense, then please feel free to, to give me a shout. I'm happy to, happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, so Doris asked, what do you do with ISO? Do you use auto ISO? Uh, Doris, you can. So there's, um, there's two ways. So you can either, if you're, in, um, if you're in aperture priority, then you can control your ISO by yourself. Um, I would usually, like for majority of these, um, of these photos, I hardly ever go over 3,200 or 4,000 ISO. But what you can also do is if you're in manual mode, is to put your ISO on auto and then just have it um, so it bounces between like a minimum and maximum. So have your minimum at 100, which is not going to go there, and then max it out to whatever you feel um, your camera's limit is. So maybe it might be 6,400 or even 8,000 with a lot of the new cameras. You can do it that way as well. Um, I know there's uh, quite a few of our guys that uh, shoot in, in manual and then just have the auto ISO bounce through. Um, I used to, I used to shoot um, auto ISO quite a bit. Now of recent, I, I prefer to just sort of deal with it by myself. In this particular case, at, at 4,000 or 3,200, 4,000 ISO, and then I just manipulate my, my shutter speed. I always, almost always with, uh, with nighttime photography, keep it down to 2.8. 
and that's the lens that I'll I'll take with me if I'm if I'm focusing on this kind of thing, and also the lens that I would recommend then for for my client. So I could bring that lens for my client for the particular safari, knowing that this is going to be some of the things that we want to try and focus on. I think it's also important to understand that this is very much a sort of Southern Africa type experience. You know, um, a lot of the places. In, in East Africa, the majority of them don't allow night drives unless you go to some of the, the private concessions in the Mara. Some of them do, uh, do do night drives, but this is very much sort of a, I think Southern Africa, Sabi Sands, South Luangwa, I think personally feel that's when you're going to get your best results with this kind of photography. Uh, let's see. Is it harder to be creative with night photography? Um, Charlotte, I don't think so. I think it's actually quite a bit easier. Um, purely because, you know, you can move that sort of light around. And I think that's, that's where the fun really comes in. And I've had a few times um, doing safaris in, in Botswana and even in South Luangwa where um, we would actually ask one of the, the camp managers or you know, some of the stuff from the camp. They also want to go out on a bit of a night drive. And we'll ask them to just um, take a vehicle with a spotlight will obviously be in radio contact with them and then position their, their vehicle, you know, and that's where it's so nice if the animal is stationary. So if you have like these lines, for example, the other vehicle can maneuver around. You can stay where you are, other vehicle can maneuver around. You can do side lighting, you can do back lighting, you can do your spotlight. So it gives you different sort of lighting opportunities, whereas you know, during the day, you can't sort of, move the sun around and once it's down it's down and once you know and often like your position there might be distracting elements in the way branches and things like this so it becomes a little bit harder during the day to, to do it i think at night it does give you that sort of creative opportunities but like i said it has to be it has to be done in a in a mindful and ethical way and i, I think um, I'd, I'd like to think a lot of the times you know people will put that first but um, I suppose you never know, really. <laughs> do um, so, can you repeat under what circumstances you would use evaluated metering at night? Um, yeah, so, Martha, I, I wouldn't use um, evaluated metering at night. Purely, purely for the um, the reason being is that it um, that it takes. Sorry, I just want to move this so I can see what I'm doing here purely because it takes this dark stuff into consideration as well so evaluated metering I would use um, like 98% of the time during the day the only time I'll use it um, I'll use spot metering during the day maybe is if you had like a scenario like this where you've got a, a very bright subject like a bird and, um, and a very dark background but otherwise, evaluative meeting, metering during the day, so it takes everything into consideration. And um, at night, then only spot metering. Because when you imagine like a scene like this, if you had to use evaluative metering now, a very small part of the scene is light. So your camera is going to try and expose for all of those dark areas and try and get detail out of that. So, like the shutter has to stay open for a very long time, in this particular case, maybe even for like 30 seconds to be able to get some detail in there. So that's where spot metering, straight focus on the leopard here. Your camera's gonna ignore trying to expose for that dark areas and you get that beautiful, um, yeah, it's almost, almost studio-like type images in there. Hope, uh, hope that helps. How do you sorry, I still see this? How do you control multiple cameras with flashes on Safari? Yeah, that's um, Brian. That's a that's a great question. Um, I don't know. So we, I'll be honest. We we don't do um, we don't do spotlight photography. I mean, uh, flash photography. Um, during the day, I can understand. You know, often if you want to get maybe a bit of full flash um, in an animal's face during the day. 
Um, but at night, it becomes so difficult to control. And as, like I said, especially for me, um, you know, running photographic safaris, if I've got two or three or four clients, you now they're all uh, popping flashes at different times. It's going to affect your exposure. You know, so you might expose for that leopard now, but as soon as you take your shot and my flash goes off, now then a lot of it's going to be very bright and you might have to underexpose. So it, it's a very difficult thing to... Um, to try and control it, to be honest with you. If you're one person, yeah, I mean, then it's obviously a lot easier. But like I said, I think my, my personal view on it is I would rather, I'm just thinking it from sort of, from my point of view, if you have set sort of light on you, your eyes sort of have over time adjust to it. But whether when it's just sort of dark, and all of a sudden this bright flash keeps on coming up every now and then. I, I personally don't, don't think it's... Um, it, it's good for the animals. Um, not saying it's right or wrong, but that's yeah, that's my my opinion. Uh, Kyla, is your camera if your camera strong into focus, will it help to use just a single center focus point, or does it make a difference? Yes, absolutely, Kyla. So you'll find when you you know when you ch choose your focal points, your center your center focus point usually is um, is the most accurate, especially when it comes to low light um, photography. If you start choosing your um, your focal point sort of down to the left or right corners, you'll see it does tend to, to struggle to focus a bit more. What I would usually do is I'm, I'll select my, my center focal point, just one of them, so just one square that, that's highlighted. It just gives me like accuracy on uh, to be dead, dead on my animal. Um, I'll push my back button, use back button focusing focus on the brightest part of my of my subject with spot metering. That'll give me the fastest shutter speed possible. Um, and then if need be, I would rather zoom out um, and then crop in afterwards. Or, you know, if, if you feel that you're not really sort of on your rule of thirds, I would rather do that cropping afterwards. Okay. Make sure you, you, you get focused and you get your shots first. Worry about the cropping um, later on. Um, during the day, obviously, it's a different story to try and get that right on camera. But I think at night, really because your camera um, struggles to focus so much, if you're not using that center focus point, that, yeah, I would rather worry about the composition later on and, and just get, a, get the animal in focus. Okay. So Tracy, I hope that's um, that's helped you from an exposure shutter speed point of view. Uh, okay, Joanna asked you, minimizing noise and night images. Look at the time when you go home and they aren't that good after all. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's Joanne. Um, yeah, look, if you go in really, really close, then you're gonna, you're gonna see some noise. You know, I think what, it's vital that, you know, with these, with these nighttime images, you're not going to try and crop like a close-up portrait of it because you, you are going to pick up noise on there. Um, I'm sorry I don't have my hard drive here now. It's, um, to, I, I could sort of zoom in close on these things. But, yeah, it's, I think it's important to remember that um, your noise, remember your noise will show in your dark areas. So if you actually like zoom in really, really close on all of these, um, you might see that, you know, there will be a bit of noise over there, but I think the, the noise reduction, basic noise reduction in, in Lightroom is, is more than enough. I haven't done any sort of um, brushes on, uh, on these images with like from, from a noise reduction point of view. I've just taken the overall luminance and just taken that up to about 11, 12, um, but yeah, the majority of these these images, and it's also, um, Joan. I think you know your cameras. It, it does make a big difference. I, I won't lie. I think the the newer cameras are getting much better, and um, with, with, with this kind of stuff, the new um, the one Ds, the new five Ds, they're really very good with um, the low light stuff. Even the um, the Canon uh, um, Nikon D five is an absolute beast in, in low light. The new Sony stuff. So definitely um, easier to do this with um, the, the newer cameras and better lenses, um, absolutely. 
so let me see. Thank you for your questions. This is very cool. I'm enjoying this. Um, uh, Joe, so chameleons in Madagascar with local guide spotlights. Yeah, then I think the, the, then the problem might be that there's obviously there's not a lot of light. So I don't know if you if you were using a two point eight lens or not, but definitely if you if you then start using a a five point six um, aperture lens, then you know you have to pump your your eyes up a lot more than what you would have had to do if you had a two point eight lens. So um, look, I'm not I'm not a big sort of tech uh, person, and um, I think it's more about what you create, but. There are definitely lim limitations when it comes to this uh, this low light stuff. Charlotte asks, do lenses make a big difference with night photography? Charlotte, absolutely. Um, I really think they they do. Um, like I said, I think if you if you have a, a 2.8 lens or a f4 lens, um, you're gonna you're gonna sort of get achieve your results a lot easier. Look, I'm not saying that you can't do it at 5.6, but then you know, you have to sort of play around with other elements. You're going to shoot at higher ISOs, um, and you might not always get as fast a shutter speed as a, as a 2.8 lens. So I think definitely if, you, if you're planning to do this, and I mean, you don't have to go and like buy a big 2.8 lens. You can go and rent one. And, um, but it's something that, that we always try and sort of mention to, to our clients. If we're going to um, a lot of these reserves where there's a good chance that we're going to be doing night time photography is try and rent um, or, or, or if you're going to buy one, buy a 2.8 lens, you know, it's even like a 70 to 200 um, works perfectly fine because a lot of these places, if they do night drives, there's a very good chance that they allow off-roading as well. So a lot of these times these animals get really, really close to you. You don't need to have like a, a massive 400 more lens to, to be able to do this kind of stuff. But I definitely feel 2.8 and F4 lens is, is vital when it comes to this kind of photography. Right, is there anything that, um, that what I said that didn't make sense? I know it's, um, it's a basic touch on it, but I hope, that, I hope that makes a little bit more sense and I hope that's given you guys a little bit more uh, food for thought and uh, sort of think of um, if you presented with, with scenes like this again, like I said, the spot metering, if you've got your spot metering on halfway there and um, and the shallow depth of field, low aperture, and then just try and be mindful, you know, when the subject comes closer to you, that you have to increase the increase the shutter speed. Okay. Low aperture, spot metering, and change your, um, your shutter speed depending on where your subject is. And I think it's something also, um, I think that people maybe don't do enough of that, but just to regularly check your images on the back of your screen, you know, so um, I think you almost get into a habit. I'm in a habit now of when I do the, especially this kind of stuff, the, the nighttime photography, every two shots I'm, I'm checking and making sure, okay, that's fine. And just to quickly, you don't have to zoom in and make sure everything is sharp. Just check your overall exposure. Take a few shots, have a look. Um, and just to just to make sure, especially you know, if if the sub subject is is moving in other direction, if it's sitting still, then happy days. You can check once or twice and then fire away, and it makes it a lot easier. Daniel, can't wait to get out and try this on our next safari. Yeah, you and me both. You and me both, man. Can't uh, can't wait to get out. And actually, trying to see if I can't arrange uh, a permit. Permit or two to um, to get out in the field. All right, I think that is it. I just want to make sure one more time that I've answered everyone's questions here. Um, yeah, I think think I've answered everyone's questions. But anyways, I mean, if you guys have um, have any further questions on this, maybe something that you think of a little bit later on that you, um, would you that you'd like me to explain to you a little bit better, send me an email. You're more than welcome to um, Johan, so J O H A N 
at wild-eye.co.za or pop me a message on Instagram and um, yeah, let, let's, let's chat if you, if you guys have any other questions about this or if something, a question pops up a little bit later. Otherwise, thank you so much um, for taking the time to, to be with me on this and I hope you guys have a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. Um, yeah, enjoy it and uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'm hosting another webinar tomorrow where I'm chatting about photographing leopards in trees and moments to look for. So look forward to seeing you guys there tomorrow. But uh, until then, um, goodbye. Have a fantastic day. Cheers, guys.